In this lesson, we're going to discuss graphing rational functions. So the first three examples, we're going to put into a calculator and see what they look like. And I've done that for us for our notes so we can see. And I want you to look at what you notice. So here in the first one, if we look, we have kind of a dotted line here. You won't necessarily see that on your calculator graphing unless you have plotted it. I did for kind of a understanding here. So we put this in, we see our function here. Notice that there is no x-intercept. So that's one thing we need to make sure we realize. There's nothing that's hitting at the x as far as our functions. So these pieces, these pieces here. Now, the dotted line is, but we'll talk about that in a second. So we have no x-intercept. Okay. We also notice that at x equals 4, which is this dotted line, that is our vertical asymptote. Okay. Now, when we put this in a calculator, if we look at where x equals 4, it'll show us undefined or an error on our calculator in Desmos. On our um, handheld calculator, it'll show us an error in our table. So we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in the next example. So when we look here, we have this graph for our next one. And we can see we have an x plus 2 and an x minus 4. We have the x minus 3 on top. And this is our graph. And notice here we have two vertical isotopes. So if we look at where those are coming from, we've talked about this previously, we know to find the vertical asymptotes, we set each piece of the denominator equal to zero. So we know that this would be a negative two and this would be a positive four. And if we look here, this is our negative two and this is our positive four. So our vertical asymptotes are at x equals negative two and x equals four. Again, if we put this in, we would get an error where those x's are uh, in a table, we would see those values, and then on the side of the table, we would see an error because their function can never cross a vertical asymptote. So we would see error. Now in Desmos, we would see this is undefined. Okay, so what else do we notice? We do have an x-intercept in this one, uh, approximately right here, and this scale's a little bit larger, so it's hard to tell exactly what that is, but to find our x-intercept, we have to notice they come from our numerator. So when we set this equal to zero, we end up with x equals three. And so this is our x-intercept, so we write that as a coordinate pair. And notice what it does there, it's passing, okay? So that's a pass. What makes it a pass is that we have a degree of one up here for this piece, okay? And our third example here, we've got lots more pieces here and pieces up here. And notice what our graph looks like. So our graph here, I'll move it up a little bit so we can see a little better, is a little bit more complex. We've got lots of pieces, lots of vertical asymptotes. So if we look here and we have three pieces at the bottom and we set them equal to zero, we should see that we have three vertical asymptotes. And that's at x equals seven, negative three, and one. So that's where we get these dotted lines from. And notice that our function doesn't cross those. It comes very close, approaching them, but it doesn't cross them. We also can look and see um, what is happening at our um, x-intercept. So I see that I have one here. Um, I possibly have something um, right around here as well. And I can look to see what those are by looking in my numerator. So when I set each of these equal to zero, I would get negative five as one of them. And I would get two as the other. Now notice because we have a multiplicity of one, this is gonna be a pass. And a multiplicity of two, this is gonna be a bounce. So if we look at this two, we can see that's a pass. And if we look at this one, that's a, a bounce. So we can kind of see how it's gonna react. Now, the x-intercepts, or the zeros, appear in the numerator 
of the fraction. And vertical isotopes appear in the denominator. Now, vertical isotopes, we call VA, they cause breaks in the domain, which occurs when we divide by zero. Remember, we never can divide by zero. So, vertical isotopes, and we'll abbreviate there with VA, causes breaks in the domain because it's across the x-axis, and that occurs when we divide by zero. And that's what gives us that error on the calculator undefined. So why do you think we keep the rational functions factored? We've had all these in factored form. And the reason we do that is to easily identify intercepts and the vertical asymptotes. And we could have more than one as we saw. Okay? So we're going to look at a couple examples without a calculator and see if we can find some information. So when we're looking without a calculator to find the zeros, we're looking at the numerator and we're setting it equal to zero. So obviously four can't be set equal to zeros. It's not part of it. We're at x minus one equal to zero. So we know that our zero is one zero. That's our x-intercept. And what's happening at that is a pass because this is a multiplicity of one and that is a pass. So we know it's passing through there. And then if we look for our vertical isotopes, here we have two pieces at the bottom, two binomials. We set those equal to zero. We end up with X equals three and X equals a negative one. So those would be, if we were to graph on a graph, we would have so one, two, three, a vertical isotope here negative one here. We know that our functions would not go across there, and we know that at one zero, here is our vertical or our um, x-intercept. So we know and it's gonna pass somehow through there. We're not sure how yet, and we could plug in some other points to find out. So I want you to try two and three and see if you can find the zeros, what happens in the vertical isotopes based on what's given and not using a calculator. So for two and three, this is your answers that you should have gotten. Make sure that you understand how they came to be. Now let's move on to the section of these functions. So here's some functions here, and we're going to look at what we notice. And we're just looking at the graphs. So if you put these in Desmos yourself, you can see them a little more clear. And I went ahead and found the vertical isotopes and placed them there since I already know how to do that, and I place them there so I could see. But if you'll notice, these functions, when we graph, this one's going this way, and this one's also going this way, notice that they curve in the same direction, which means they kind of meet each other at this vertical isotope, okay? That's the same direction. So that's something we need to write. The graph curved in the same direction, okay? And so look at what you think might cause that when you look at this um, function here, this equation. So we'll look at the second one I've already graphed for you. And I did the vertical isotopes. And notice that we have this section here and this section here curving in the same direction and this section and this section curving in the same direction. So this one also curved in the same direction, okay? So something is making that happen. See if you think you know, and we'll look at the next section. All right, the next one's got lots of pieces. We have three vertical asymptotes, and I've already plotted them for you. Notice our vertical asymptote here, we have this piece of the function, it's going towards and towards, that's the same. This one here, we have it going towards, towards, they're approaching at the same. And this one's going towards and towards, the same. So we have situations where we're 
going to the same place at the same direction, just like the other two, so the curve in the same direction. So notice that because of the vertical isotope, the graph approached it at the same direction when you looked at this graph. And what is causing this to happen is something in the problem. So if the binomial in the denominator, so we're just looking at the denominators here, here, and here, if they are squared, then the function approaches the asymptote from the same direction. And this helps you with graphing. Okay, so notice this was squared and squared. All of them were squared, so it approached in the same direction. If the binomial is not squared when the function approaches asymptote, then they come from opposite directions. Okay, so here's an example. We have an isotope, and it's coming here from the same direction. This would be a same. So we know this would be something that is a binomial that's squared, okay? This one's coming in opposite directions. So one's going here and they're opposite here. Then we know this is the opposite. This is what that would look like. It's because they are not squared. So let's talk about some main ideas from this section and what we've learned fully. Kind of sum it up. So our x-intercepts are in the what of the fraction? Well, we should know they're in the numerator. If the binomial is not squared, the function will pass the x-intercept. And if the binomial is squared, so we're talking about multiplicities, the function will bounce at the x-intercept. So we're talking about finding the numerator, using the numerator, find your x-intercept, and that multiplicity tells us what is happening um, at the function. Vertical isotopes are in the denominator. If the binomial is not squared, the function will approach the asymptote from opposite directions. And if it is squared, the function will approach it from the same direction. And to remember, why do we keep things factored? Because we want to easily identify our x-intercepts and our vertical asymptotes. Okay, so we're going to use our next section, we've talked about this previously, um, to find out about our end behavior and what helps us determine that. How our function acts and as the end behavior is determined by the horizontal asymptote. And we've talked about this previously where we look at the degrees of the top and the bottom. So we had a little helper with that. If our degree of our numerator is less than degree of our denominator, our horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. And I think about that as being um, a heavy bottom, being uh, a lot on the bottom, so it's pulling it down. So it's kind of pulling it down to that y equals. So you might think about um, a heavy bottom you may even think about it as little over top or little over big. Same thing. So the big is on the bottom and the little is on the top. So a degree of numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator. We have y will be the ratio of the leading coefficients. And then if our degree of our uh, numerator is larger than our degree of our denominator, we have no horizontal asymptote. But we then have to look to see if we have either a slant or oblique. So when we have none, this is where the top is uh, heavy. So big over little. 
but we can have a slant asymptote if the top degree is one higher than the bottom, only one. If it is more than one, if the top degree is more than one, so two or more, then bottom, then we would have what's called an oblique isotope. All right, so an oblique. So we're gonna look at some of these examples up here and help determine our end behavior. So if we look at our degree, if we don't have an X value, this is a degree of zero on the top. And then because we just have a one X here, this is a degree of one. So our bottom is heavy. So remember a little over top or heavy bottom, that is always gonna be Y equals zero. And then this one's gonna be zero as well. So we know what is happening for our end behavior. Then we look at this next one. We have a degree of one here. This has a degree of one, this has a degree of one, so that's a degree of two. So we know that this again, our bottom is heavy. So when our bottom is heavy, Y is zero. Is our horizontal asymptote, Y would be zero. Now if we look at our next one, we have a two and this would be a one. So we have a total of three here. And we have a one, a one, and a one. We have a total of three here. And these are equal. So when they're equal, we look at the leading coefficient. Well, our leading coefficient is a one and a one. So a one over a one is actually one. So this would be y approaches one, and y approaches one. So that will help you understanding where your function will uh, leave off as far as end behaviors. So on the first one to find our zeros, we're going to look at our numerator, and we see x minus 1 set equal to 0. We would have a 0 at 1, 0. Because it has a multiplicity of just 1, it will pass there. Now to find our y-intercepts, we need to plug in 0 for our x's. So we have 4, 0 plugged in for our x, 0 for our x squared. We end up with a negative 4 on top. A negative 3 squared would give us a 9. So our y value is negative 4 over 9. So our y-intercept is 0, negative 4 over 9. So when x is 0, our y is negative 4 ninths. Our vertical asymptote we find from our denominator setting equal to 0. So we know that this is going to be x equals 3. When we think about how it approaches, it is squared, so we know it's approaching from the same side. Okay, and then our horizontal isotope, we look at our total degrees. So we have a degree of one and degree of two. So we are bottom heavy. So then we know that our horizontal isotope is y equals zero. And that can help us know our end behaviors. You try two and three and then come back and check. So when you look at two and three, notice each piece and see if you are right. Now with this horizontal asymptote on number two, notice that the top was heavier than the bottom, which means we have no horizontal asymptote. And because it's bigger than just one degree, that's an oblique. So that's what that would look like. So uh, if you want to put that in your calculator or in Desmos to see how it graphs, it may give you an understanding more of what oblique looks like. Then we have here, we have um, our vertical asymptote. We have the same degree. So that's when we use the um, 1 over 1 or the ratio as a lean coefficient. So 1 over 1 is 1, so y equals 1. So that's where our horizontal asymptote would be. I left off the e there. All right. All right, so our next section, we're going to look at a few features that we need to talk about in order to graph. And we're going to look at one of them in a calculator in a minute to see kind of what it looks like. But without a calculator, we're going to look to see what do these have in common. So if we look at this first function here, we notice that we could cancel out the x minus 1 and x minus 1. So they have a common um, function or common uh, factor in their function. 
we look at the second one, we can also see, oh, this one has an x plus one, x plus one. So that's a common factor as well. And then our last one, we can look and we see an x plus four and x plus four. That is also a common factor, one numerator and one the denominator. These create something in a graph that you can't see on a calculator. And when this happens, these are called holes. So it creates literally a hole in the graph. Okay. So we have a very, a basically a point, a hole of discontinuity. So we know when we graph functions, they should be smooth and continuous. Well, this is kind of stopping that and it starts back over. So that one's not included in our function. Now on a calculator, we're gonna do this on Desmos. We're gonna look at a table of what happens. So I'm gonna take this first one and put it in Desmos and we're gonna turn it to a table and see what happens. So I've put this function in the Desmos, and once you get it in there, you can kind of see the graph. Notice that you would have to graph the vertical isotopes if you wanted, and you could do that um, by putting in the x um, equals negative three by looking to change it to a dot. You kind of hold your color down, and you can change your lines to whatever um, shape you want. And we'd also have um, x equals one. Oop. and we'd have a dot. Now, the problem is we have something now hitting at our green line here, um, this piece right here, and it's hitting on our asymptote, which we can't have happen. So this, can't, this little spot right here cannot be included, and so that's where our hole needs to reside, which is where we have the one. Notice that it, it's there um, because they're alike. If we wanna change this to a table, we hit our little sprocket, change it to a table, and we can see where X is one, it's undefined. You can't plot a hole there on Desmos. Um, it won't show you, you have to understand the reasoning. It shows up as an error in our calculator or undefined. Now, the difference here, the vertical isotopes are barriers that the function cannot cross. They're infinitely discontinuous, so that anything on that vertical isotope cannot be included in our function, any of those values. A hole, however, is just a single point of discontinuity that the function doesn't exist at. So that's why you get on your calculator um, the error or the undefined, but you will not see the hole you have to graph it by hand, you have to draw the hole, which is an open circle. Now, holes trump vertical asymptotes, so we always find them first, and then the remaining information we use to find what's left over. First thing I'm gonna look for is my holes. So I'm looking for common factors. So if I look here, I have x plus seven and x plus seven, so there is going to be a hole there. So I know if I set that equal to zero, I get the x is negative seven. And then to find the other piece, because the hole is actually a coordinate, I need to plug that in to what is left. So what is left here after I take my hole out is the negative five x plus two over x minus two. So I'm gonna plug in my value of negative seven in for my x's and find my other coordinate my y value. So negative five plugged in, I'm plugging in my negative seven plus two over negative seven minus two. So I end up with a negative seven and a positive two gives me a negative five. A negative five and a negative five gives me a positive 25. And then a negative seven and a negative two give me a negative nine. So now we're gonna use the rest, um, what is left over, so this leftover part after we took the whole out of our equation, and we're gonna find the other information. So we are gonna find the zeros. Remember the zeros are only in our numerators. So x plus two, so what would make that a zero? We know that's a negative two. So we have a negative two zero for our zeros, our x-intercept. What is happening there? Well, that's got a multiplicity of one, so that's a pass. Now we need to find our y-intercept, so we're gonna plug in zero for our x's, only on what's left, so negative five 
zero plus two over zero minus two, and we end up with a negative 10 over negative two, which reduces down to a five. So our y-intercept is zero, five. Now our vertical asymptotes, we look at our denominator. Our denominator is x minus two. We set that equal to zero, and we get x equals two. And think about how it approaches, what's happening there. Well, it's not squared, so that means it's gonna approach opposite, on opposite sides of the asymptote, it's gonna be going opposite directions. We already know our hole, so we'll write our hole back, and we can have more than one hole um, in problems. We only have one for this one. And now we're gonna do our horizontal asymptote, and again, we're only using what's left. So if we look at our degrees, we have a degree of one and a degree of one, so they're the same. So when we have the same degree, we look at our leading coefficient. So our leading coefficient is negative five over one. So negative five over one means that our horizontal asymptote is at y equals negative five. Now I want you to try five and six, and then come back and check and see how you did. Second one here, we find that we have two a whole x plus two and x plus two. So our value of our x for our whole is negative two. We plug it in to find our y value, and we get three. So our whole is at negative two, three. That's literally a um, discontinuity spot um, that does not exist on our function, so it's a whole. We find what is left over is five times x minus one over x minus three. And we use that to find our zeros, which is one zero. Know that it passes. We use um, zero for x's to find our y-intercept. And then we use our vertical asymptote. We use it to set equal to our bottom value or denominator, x minus three. We find it's x equals three. We know it approaches opposite because it's not squared. And then we, our holes are rewritten, and then our horizontal asymptotes, because they are the same degree um, of one degree over one degree, then we use our leading coefficients, five over one, to then find that our horizontal asymptote is y equals five. Now with number six, we actually have two holes. So you have x minus one and x minus one, that cancels out, so you've got one hole at x equals one, and then you have another hole at x equals negative two. Now that's just your x value, so you have to plug it back into what's left and find your y value. So you end up with a hole at one negative two and at negative two, two. Then use what's left to also find your zeros. We have a zero at negative three, zero, that's our x-intercept. We know at that point it passes. Find our y-intercept, find our vertical asymptote, by using our denominator, what's left over. We know it approaches the same because it's squared. And then we rewrite our holes, and then because this is bottom heavy, meaning more degrees on the bottom, then we know our horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. All right, so I made a little cheat sheet kind of to help you the steps um, that you might need. So the very first thing is we want to always factor. So we're gonna factor first. Um, the top can't change, so we'll leave it as four. But we can factor the bottom. We can take out an x, and we get x minus three. Okay? Now, we're going to identify any holes. Well, there's nothing that has common factors on the top and the bottom, so there are no holes for this one. So next, we're going to go to our x-intercepts. We're going to look for anything on the top and set it equal to zero. Well, the only thing on the top is the negative four, or four, and so we have no x-intercepts. And if we look at the next thing is our y-intercepts, we're going to plug in zero for our x's. Well, immediately, if I think about plugging in a zero for my x's, I'm multiplying by a zero on the bottom. So I'm going to end up with negative four divided by zero, which we cannot do as an error in our calculator. So we have no y-intercepts either. Now, let's look at our vertical asymptotes. So if we look at our vertical asymptotes, that's where we're setting each piece of our denominator equal to zero. So we have x equals zero for one of our vertical asymptotes, and we have um, x equals three for the other vertical asymptote. Think about how this would look. So because these are not squared, um, and now we just got one piece here, so that's a little bit different. Um, instead of a binomial, but, but they're not squared, so they are actually going to be opposite. So they're going to be approaching the uh, asymptote opposite directions, okay? 
Now, let's find our horizontal asymptote. Our horizontal asymptote is we use by degree. So the top degree here is zero. So our horizontal asymptote. Our top degree is zero, and our bottom degree we have one, one, so we have two. So this is bottom heavy, which means our horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. All right, so we're going to stop at 6, and we're going to put these things on our graph, and then that will help us be able to determine our domain and range, and our um, few more points to plot um, will kind of help us with that. So I'm going to use a different color here to do our asymptote. So my vertical asymptote, we're doing um, x is 0, so put a little dotted line through x is 0, and then x is 3. It's kind of off my line a little bit. All right, our horizontal asymptote, we'll use another one, is at y equals 0. And now we're going to plot our points. Now, we can have something that can go in here this way or this way. We're not really sure exactly. Um, it could go here, could go here. So to be able to find exactly kind of where it goes, we're going to plug in a point. So let's say we use 1, and we're going to plug it into our function that's left. So if I plug in, say, f of 1 into my problem, and I'm picking points on either side of my asymptotes, I'm going to plug in my 1 and 1 minus 3 and get a quick kind of understanding of where it is. Well, 1 minus 3 will give me a negative 2 times 1. That's negative 2. So I end up with a 2. So I know that a point's going to be here. Okay. And we know that they're going um, opposite. So when we think about once we get this graph, they, they can help us with the other sections. So we then can think about what if we plugged in the 2. Well, if we plugged in the 2, f of 2, we would end up with negative 4, 1, and then we have the um, 2 minus 3, and we end up with negative 4 over negative 2, which is also 2. So that tells me that this is kind of going to be sketched in this direction. Okay? Now, we need to go ahead and find some points to our left side and our right side. We could start and plug in 4, and that will tell us whether or not um, we need to go. Now, if we think about how things approach, we already know these are supposed to be opposite. So if this one went this way, that means this one is going to have to go this way. So we should have here. So let's plug in 4 just to see. So if I plugged in f of 4, I end up with negative 4 over 4 times 4 minus 3, which gives me negative 4 over 4, which is a negative 1. So 4, negative 1 is roughly there, so I know it's got to go. Can't go across the horizontal asymptote or touch the vertical asymptote. It'll get close. It's not the greatest line, but it'll get close. Now, when we think about the other side, because we had something squared originally, those are opposites of each other. So we know that it's supposed to go here. Now, if you didn't know, you could pick a point close to your asymptote, like negative 1, and you plug that in there to what you have. So I'd have negative 4 over negative 1 and negative 1 minus 3. And I'd end up with negative 4 over 4, which gives me a negative 1. So here I'm roughly, I should probably be up there a little bit further there. Okay, and I know it can't go across my horizontal or my vertical asymptote, so I know it's got to stay in that range. So that is my uh, graph. So now I can look at my domain and range, and remember the vertical asymptotes stop that um, from happening, like has breaks in it. So if I look at my uh, domain, those are my x's, to infinity, all the way to right here where our zero is, but it's not included. And then I pick up and I go from zero all the way to three, but it's not included. And then I pick up and I go from three, not included, all the way to positive infinity. Okay. You may see it also written as x such that x is not equal to um, zero um, or three. Okay. And then with our ranges, 
we think about going from the very bottom, so we're going all the way up. When it gets to here at zero, it stops. So we go all the way up to zero, and then it breaks, and it starts back again at two. Okay, and then we continue to go up um, based on our graph. So then you could write your uh, ranges that way. Okay, to be more precise, you can get more points to plot, but we're just kind of wanting a sketch to be able to, to plot enough to kind of be able to tell us about um, the function. All right, I want you to try the next one and then come back and see how you did. All right, so in this problem, we factor first and I pulled out a GCF and then I could factor further. And I noticed that then I have a whole, the x plus two and x plus two, those are the same factors. So I have x plus two set equal to zero, which gives me an x equals negative two. So that's my x value for my whole. Plug that in to what is left, which what is left will be just this piece right here. And I end up with a negative two. So I have a whole at negative two, negative two. So I literally on my graph, plot a hole, a circle, an open circle at negative two, negative two. My x-intercept, I have negative three, zero, by just setting the x plus three at the numerator equal to zero. So I went ahead and plotted that, negative three, zero. And then my y-intercept, I plugged in my zero for my x's, and I end up with zero, six. So I went ahead and plotted a point there. My vertical asymptote, setting my denominator equal to zero, I find out that x equals negative one. So I went ahead and done a, a vertical line there. I know nothing's gonna cross there. And I know I have it approaching um, opposite because it's not squared. And so that kind of helps me kind of know where things are going to go. And then my horizontal asymptote, I um, look at my degrees. Well, I have a degree of 1 over degree of 1, which is the same. So then I look at my leading coefficient. I have 2 over 1, so it's y equals 2. So I put a dotted line there. So now that i got a couple points um, plotted, I know that my function is going to go really, really close to the vertical asymptote, but not touch it. It's got to go through those two points. I found an extra point just to kind of see how my curve would go, and it's going to go towards the horizontal and not touch it either. So that's roughly uh, what it would look like. On this one, I have a um, x-intercept, so I know I'm going to go close to that vertical, or excuse me, horizontal asymptote and try to do this smoothly. When I get to my hole, I'm gonna stop because that hole is not included, and then I'll pick up off of the other side and continue on. So this will be what my graph would look like. So then to find your ranges in your domains, my domains are at negative infinity. They go all the way over till we hit the negative one, that's not included. Um, and then we have to account for the hole there. Um, so we can't have a value at the negative two for here. We're not worried about the pieces. That's why the hole kind of counts for that. And then we pick up and we go from the other side all the way over. Um, then with our ranges, we go from negative infinity all the way up to where that one's not included, um, that negative two there, and then pick up, go up to our horizontal and then pick up and continue to go on. Okay, so we're not worried about too much of you writing the domain ranges down, but be able to kind of understand if something is in the domain range.